You do know that, don't you? Last week we began this song, and uh, I was hoping to do it in a couple of parts, but I don't, I don't think so because this song is so loaded. Let me read some of the verses right away. My soul, my soul, praise Yahweh, praise the Lord. This is our review from last week. The psalmist, some of your translations would say, bless the Lord, O my soul. But it is an imperative command in the Hebrew where David is telling his soul, bless the Lord. This is not only an excitement about God, this is a discipline to bless, have his soul. Now we said the soul is made up of the mind and the will and the emotions because we're soul, spirit, and body. But he says, my soul, mind, will, my emotions. Did you hear that? Emotions, it's okay. You know what I love about children? The same thing that Jesus did. They're very real. I mean, before kids get too messed up by the adults, well, no offense, before, the, when you bring kids into, I have had kids who have never been in church in their life, and they come into a praise service, and they're just, and, and all excited, and the adults are sitting there like, they sing, they clap, they do whatever, most of the time. And so there is this joy that is there in the psalmist when he thinks about the Lord. So he says, my soul, I want you to bless the Lord, and not only in my mind, with my will, and with my emotions. And then he said, all that is within me, which meant everything of my body. I'm going to praise the Lord with my body. Can you do that this morning? Even your body. Oh, I know, you've heard this before. Joy and I watch twins games now and then, and uh, that takes prayer in itself. But we watch, <laughs> we watch twins games. We're going to get to our first St. Paul Saints game this week. But we watch, and here's the thing. I hear all this stuff about, oh, I better sit down again. It's not, it's not, it's not my personality. You know what? When people are excited enough about something, we may have different personalities and different character, but I've seen people at a Twins game. I've seen them in playoff games, and everybody seems to be a little more animated, and you'll see grandmas and grandpas doing the wave and all of that stuff. You know that. And that's baseball. And we're talking about the God of the universe, right? Souls, bless the Lord this morning. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So then he, we talked about the only way you can truly cry out, bless the Lord, is to remember you have to have something that you know why you should bless Him. Now there's everything, all creation, everything that you see, everything that's made, every good and perfect gift, but here's the way to really bless Him with all of your mind and will and emotions. It's this. If you knew what you were before Christ. If you are a new creation in Christ and your sins are forgiven and you're on a new road, in other words, in order to bless the Lord, you have to know what you were or what you are without Him. What are you apart from God? How, how much is He a part of your life, your day, your decisions, your attitudes, your interactions, your relationships? Your transactions. So, David knew what he was before. He knew sin. And he knew grace even in the Old Testament. We said that. Then, he has his being, bless the Lord. David cries out with all my being. And then last week I said that the word bless, the word bless is to kneel. It is to kneel and salute. In the Hebrew, to kneel and salute, adore God. To bow before. Then we said we reverence his holy name. Do you remember we said bless his holy name? And we said the name was character. It's everything about who he is. It's his rule and, and it, his reputation. Right? When you bless the name... We sing songs, there are several songs about blessing the name. We're blessing his reputation and his rule in my life. Okay, we got through verse 1 last week. We're looking at 2, but I want to start with this. He says, 
remember, and I think last week I told you about reputation. I think I mentioned my dad's reputation at the bank in the town where he lived, got him huge loans with no signature. That kind of reputation, those days are kind of gone. Way back in the old days, I used to watch a boxer named Floyd Patterson. Floyd Patterson had a manager, Castamano. They were the dying breed. They never signed a contract with one another. And Customato said, if I can't trust his word and he can't trust mine, then we have nothing. And he managed them and they made millions of dollars and never signed a contract. Wouldn't it be something to have character like that? Okay, so that's his reputation. Now, remember his benefits. Benefits in the Hebrew is not just a list of things. The word for benefits in the Hebrew translates into treatment. How God treats us. That's the benefit. His treatment of me. And so David had a sense of that. Now here's the problem. He goes on to say in verse 2, Remember, do not forget all of his treatment of you. He's forgiving. He's loving. He's kind. He's patient. He's merciful. He hears you. He sees you. When nobody in the room sees you, he sees you. When you feel left out, you're in with him. His treatment of you. And he says, don't Forget, But there's a little bit different flavor to the word forget here. It is this. It is actually not to forget like, oh, I forgot God. You know, I forgot. I forgot what he did. It is more of a laying aside. I just put it aside. Or, do you know, if, if you had in, 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 in any time in your life magazines, and you had a magazine on the coffee table, and then you'd get a new magazine and then one would go on top of that or then you'd put all these magazines together or in a rack and, and you don't even know what's in there anymore because you got a new magazine and all of that. And so the old ones can sit there and you say, yeah, I love these magazines. You're saving them, but you never look at them. Oh, wait, let me give you another example. To lay aside, does anyone have a closet in your home where you're just putting things that you're not wearing, but you might? <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've got, I've got a, okay. <laughs> Joy is looking at me really funny right now. Um, I have this, I have a closet in my office at home, and it is filled with clothes that when I, I tell myself, when I get back to looking like I did then, <laughs> when I get back, when I get back to what I was 20 years ago, those clothes will be good. <laughs> okay, sure, laugh at me. Um, the reality is, it's not that you don't know they're there, but they're off to the side and they're not used and they're not thought about and that's almost this word it's like I put off to the side I kind of yeah that's that's not new let's you know you got the old closet and the new closet or part of the closet these are for the old clothes this is the new now listen David is saying, don't lay aside. He also says something else. To keep on, there's a take for granted. So it's not just don't forget, it's don't take for granted. Maybe we could turn over to Deuteronomy, and it is, um, well, in, verse, in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, verse 12, first of all, he lists a lot of things that God has done. Deuteronomy means a repeat. It's the second. 
It's like the laying out of the blessings, the laws of God, the commands of God, and the blessings. It means a second or another. Okay, so Deuteronomy is filled with reminding the children of Israel what God has done for them. And, and, in, and in verse 12 of 6, he says, Be careful not to forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the place of slavery. What does Egypt represent? It represents sin. Two things. You're in a land that isn't yours. Okay? The children of Israel ended up in Egypt, and it wasn't God's place for them, but they were there by his divine hand. God saved the nation of Israel because they, by bringing them to Egypt. But Egypt is sin, but he says Egypt and slavery. He brought you out of a world that is not God's. And he also, so you're forgiven sin if you confess, but he also brought you out of the bondage of sin. I'm going to tell you there are two things that are needed with sin. Forgiveness is not enough. And going on and saying, I can't help but sin, 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 sin. That is not biblical. That is not in scripture. You are to leave your life of sin and you are to put every bit of your being into walking away from sin. How can you that are dead to sin live any longer in sin? I didn't say how can you ever sin. I'm saying how can you live in it at all? So there's two remedies all the time for sin. And one is the forgiveness and one is the freedom from it. You are not to be in bondage to sin. Now I don't know. It would be interesting. I often wished that we had this ability to, I could see, you know how they do in cartoons and magnet, where in the old days you read the cartoon or whatever, the comic books, and you'd see the captions over the head. I would just love to see over your head what you're thinking when I, when I see sin, when I say sin. You need to, because it would really be interesting what sin is. Very often it's the other guys. Like I said, oh, I haven't killed anybody this week. Woo you know? Sin. Some of the most incredible, damaging sins are the sins of gossip and jealousy. Yeah. Anger. Mm -hmm. Negative. And so, some people say, I'm forgiven, but are you free from the bondage of those old things? Paul says, take off that old garment and put on the new. So here's the psalmist. He's saying, now over in Deuteronomy 8, it really gets, it really gets good. So it says, God's bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and waters and springs and on and on, valleys and hills flowing and wheat and barley and vines and figs and all of this. And he says, when you eat and are full, you will praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Then he's, verse 11 starts our emphasis. Be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commands and ordinances and statutes I'm giving you today. And then he goes on, when you are eat and full and you build beautiful houses to live in, and your herds and your flocks grow large, and your silver and gold multiply, and everything else you have increases, be careful that your heart doesn't become proud, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery. He says it again. You're not just... Don't forget, he led you through great and terrible wilderness, poisonous snakes, scorpions, thirst. He brought water out of a rock for you. He fed you in the wilderness with manna. And he did that so that your fathers, in, or he, he humbled them and tested them so that in the end, he might cause them to prosper. He says, I ended up giving you, this is what he said, that God ended up letting them be hungry and then providing manna so they would realize that it isn't what you depend upon. Man does not live by bread alone. And so God wants us 
to know that our dependence, when people say, I do pretty good myself, you don't take a breath that God doesn't grant you. You can't go to work tomorrow. Do you know how fast life changes? Do you know how fast it can change? It's unbelievable. In a moment, I was over at Centennial Park. They were doing a food distribution. I was there last Wednesday, and then they asked. They said if somebody would like prayer, that I would be available. And this lady came up, and she said, could you pray with me? And we stepped aside. And she said, my brother, and I'm the only one in the area, my brother, he is really healthy. He bikes all the time. He loves life. They found his bike in the middle of the road, and he was dead. She said, I don't even know how to tell the other sister or anything else. She said, it's over. He's gone. Yesterday he was biking. Today he's gone. Listen. Let's bless the Lord for what we have today. This moment. Relationships. Do you value your family? Do you tell your family you value them? Do you tell them they're valuable to God and they're valuable to you? Do you love them with the love of God? So he says, when you have all these blessings... Here's what he says. You may say to yourself, my power and my own ability have gained this wealth for me. But remember that the Lord your God gives you the power, whether it's to gain wealth or money, in order to confirm his covenant with you. So he's talking to them. All right. Um, so his pardon. He... Don't, don't forget. And now again, let's look at verse 3 of Psalms. He says, and forget not, or remember all of his benefits, and now he begins to list them. He forgives. He forgives all your sin. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with goodness. Your youth is renewed. First, the most important thing is he forgives all of your sins. Now, the word forgive is the word pardon. But I'll emphasize first, all, any, every sin can be forgiven by God. The reason I say that, you go, I've heard that. Of course you have, all your life. So have I. But I know that the enemy has a way, and especially if we are not confessing our sin before God to him regularly, the enemy has a way of saying, well, that sin, oh, if people only knew you had done that. Every sin but certain ones. The enemy has a way of targeting. But I'm going to tell you the word of God says all of your sin is covered by the blood of Christ. All of it. And the enemy's a liar. God tells the truth. Now, we do have to go a little further because your sin isn't covered just because Christ died on the cross. His blood his life is a gift that must be received and there must be repentance and confession and agreement with God. Because there's a lot of thinking today, well, it's forgiven. I said I'm sorry. You know how many times I've told that story. It's like little kids. Remember, you know, it's my favorite one. Don't eat the cookies before dinner. Where do you think they're going to go? To the cookies. I'm sorry. <laughs> and you turn your head and they're right back to the cookies. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you're not sorry. <clears throat> you don't keep doing something you're sorry for. You're sorry you're getting caught. 
You're sorry that there's bad consequences. You're sorry that way. But you're not sorry. You haven't died to sin yet. If you keep doing the same thing, you're not dead to sin. Now we're not talking about somebody that's struggling, that's seeking God, that really is repentant. God knows your failures. His mercy is new every morning. But see, He knows the attitude, not just the behavior. He knows your heart. And so the psalmist cries out, He forgives all, any and every one of your sins. Pardons. Let's talk about pardon. What does that mean? What is a governor's pardon or a presidential pardon? Because that's the word Hebrew here. He pardons. Here's what it is. Men's pardon is like this. You're guilty. You've been sentenced. You commit the crime. You're in prison most of the time. Or there's some part of the sentence has been served. And then, and sometimes there's pardons because, oh, we got new evidence. But usually that's a new trial. But a pardon often comes, I'm going to pardon this person because they've served so much of their sentence. And they've been a model prisoner. Or they've done this and that. And I'm going to pardon them because they're really, you know, good. Okay. But the sin itself is not forgiven. Right? The record is still there. So that kind of pardon, it's nice, but you still carry around the record. The record is there. It's on file. It's in courts. It's there. God's pardon is not like that. God's pardon, man retains the record, but God, expunges the record. Did you know when you truly confess your sin and ask Christ to come into your heart and you mean it, He takes the record of your past. It's done. He bleaches it. You ever heard that word? He bleaches your record with the blood of Jesus Christ. It's washed away. Not only do you not have the penalty the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Could you just kind of shout inside, if not out loud this morning, Jesus pardons me. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Jesus pardons me. That's right. You're, Jesus pardoned me. I'm forgiven. There's no record. It's gone. You can go and look through all the files you want to. You can dredge up everything you've ever heard about me. And trust me, there's a lot worse things than you've ever heard. And you can find all the people that know all the nasty stuff about me. It's pretty much been exposed in the newspapers for me, so good luck with finding something new. But here's the deal. You can dredge it up. You can find somebody that in my youth knew what I did. But you go looking through the courts of heaven and you will not find a record. I've been pardoned. I've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive. And do what? Not just forgive. Stop with just the forgiveness and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1. By the way, if you want to hear all about sin and how awful it is and what God can do, read 1 John. So the psalmist is exhilarated by the fact he pardons all my sin. You know what? One of the scriptures says, two scriptures say this. God remembers your sin no more. Huh? He said, I'll remove your sin from you and remember it no more. People will remember. They will remember. Oh, trust me, they remember. And the enemy will remember. And he'll get you to remember. But he says, I will remember your sin no more. 
Now, it isn't because God has Alzheimer's. God is not, oh, I forgot. I want to tell you what a blessing this is. God doesn't forget. He's not losing it. It isn't that he got so busy with other things that he doesn't remember. He's, this is a choice. He says, I will choose to remember your sins no more. I'm not going to think about it. That's different than losing your mind. He is using his mind to say, no more. Oh, there's freedom in that this morning. Aren't you glad? There's freedom in that. Okay, so the, 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 the psalmist David, oh, but we've used the term, by the way, um, we use the term justification. Anybody heard that word? Justification? And yep, and justification, people have this cute little thing to say, it's just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I never sinned. And so the psalmist, the psalmist, in, 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 in chapter 32, I don't know if I can find that. Let's see. Psalm 32. The psalmist cries out and he says, there's several different things in it. Verses, verse 1, he says, How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And, and then... In verse 2, so he talks about two different things, transgression and sin. How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. There is the attitude of sin and there is the act of sin and, and Jesus' blood takes care of all of it. Okay? The attitude that got you there. He can cleanse that. And then in verse 2, he says... How joyful is the man the Lord does not charge with sin. So three different words are used there. Transgression, sin, sin, and then he uses later the word iniquity. God wants to deal and has dealt through Jesus Christ with every single thing in our lives. He deals with not only the act of sin, but the sin nature. Paul writes all about that in Romans. He said, the flesh wants to do good and can. And he said, the things I want to do, I don't do. He's not talking about his current life. Don't get confused and don't let people water that scripture down. Paul is not saying, I'm the chief sinner today. I told you this before. Do you think Paul meant he was the biggest sinner now after Christ? Not at all. He's saying, the things that I want to do in the flesh, I don't do. I, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. Who will rescue me from this? Praise be to God. And then he writes about walking in the Spirit. So pardoning is more than expunging the record. Now imagine this. He, when he heals your iniquity, removes your... He is cleansing as well. It's a lot to be grateful for. Um, do you remember? Do you remember what David did? How many know what David did? Don't we all hear that story a lot? Okay. David was called a man with the heart after God. This is Old Testament stuff, by the way. He had bulls and goats and high priests. The blood of Jesus Christ had not been shed, but he was looking forward to the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. But here's David knew all of the degrees of sin. And then over in Psalm 51, he has a prayer of repentance. But you need to know the background first. David, not the whole story, it's, it's, it's a whole message in itself. David was in a place on the rooftop 
where he would go and he would write these beautiful songs and so on. And David was in this place and he saw a woman and lusted after her across on a rooftop bathing. And he lusted after her. And the, the temptation was not so much the problem, although he obviously got his eyes off God. He had a palace. He had everything. And he got his eyes on her. And then he began to covet her. And David went through this process of ordering her to the palace. And then getting involved in sin with her. And then he went on and her husband was a soldier in David's army. And David went on and he tried to cover up the sin because she began, she became pregnant. He tried to cover up the sin. So he got his, her, his, her husband to come home and tried to get her to sleep with him, saying, go to your wife, take a break from the war. His soldiers are all badly. If he can just get this covered up. But see, man's cover-up is not God's cover-up. God's cover-up is the blood of Christ. And it wipes it away, but man's cover-up is, I'll just try to minimize this. I'll just try to do a little better. I'll fix this. Maybe if nobody finds out. But it goes on, and David, he, he could not get the man to do what he tried, what he wanted him to do, Nate, uh, Uriah, her husband. And finally, Uriah, David sends him out into the front lines, and he told his commander, put him in the front lines. There was premeditated murder. Premeditated. He says, put him in the front lines. And, when, and there, not just put him in the front lines, you know what he told him? He said, and when the battle gets rough, withdraw. What? You've really thought this out, David. And Uriah got killed. Now here's the problem. You can't bless God if you know your sin, but you don't confess it to God. If you are not in the place of acknowledging, we can be blind to our own sin, but wide awake to somebody else's. And you can't, you can't so bless the Lord unless you truly are sitting here forgiven today knowing that you've confessed your sin before God and you are pardoned and you are cleansed before Him. And I'll tell you how bad it gets because David, David, Nathan, a prophet, came to him and said, David, I want to tell you a story. And he tells him a story. He says there was this man. You know, it's getting ready for the Passover. He actually was going to put on a meal. He had a guest and He's going to put on a meal. And this man had just one lamb. He had one lamb. His favorite lamb. And he said another man, who had a whole herd of lambs, decided to take the one man's lamb and kill it for his dinner. What do you think should happen, David? David knew what justice was for others. He said that man, I'll, I'll tell you what. Are you kidding me? He took this guy's only lamb when he has a bunch and he killed this guy's lamb? He said, I think he should be put to death. Woo! And Nathan said, you're the man. Now, David's heart was broken. But how could he have been so blind? Because sometimes we get comfortable with an element of sin. Oh, I'm not as bad as I used to be. This isn't too bad. I used to do this every day. Now I'm only doing it once a week. That's not repentance. Sin needs to become disgusting. Man, God, kill it. Kill it. I told you about the little boy. His parents said it's true. He, at, at nine or ten years old, had a hunger to not sin. He kept telling his parents and reading the scriptures at 9 or 10 and saying, I'm not going to sin against God. That's a wonderful way to start out. I know you'll go to a lot of churches this morning, and that's fine. And they'll say, we're all a bunch of sinners. Well, don't find, find that. Find that in Paul. Show me where he writes to the sinners at Corinth or to the sinners in 
Philippians, he writes to the saints. You're a saint that may fall into sin, but you're not a sinner trying to be a saint. Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. Leave your life of sin now. Then he said to the man at the Bethesda pool, stop your sinning lest something worse happens to you. It's a constant message. You mean he's so cruel that he will tell you to do something that's impossible? Well, it's impossible to do until you've really confessed. Listen to this. This is just a little bit. First of all, David repents. Be gracious to me, God. Psalm 51. According to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. Cleanse me from my sin. He's not even just saying forgive it. Cleanse me from it. Not in it, from it. He says, my sins before me always, against you and you alone have I sinned and done this evil. So you're right when you pass sentence. You're blameless. Indeed, I was guilty when I, when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. And then he goes on, and instead of just talking about repentance, he says, I want restoration in my life. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins. Then he says, listen to this. God, verse 10, 51, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit. You know what steadfast means? I'm not moving off of God's will. Steadfast spirit. My spirit's going to be fixed, focused, locked on to Jesus Christ. I've given you this example also, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep giving them. A guy said, you can't help but sin every day. First of all, you better know the definition of sin, the difference between faults. Confess your faults one to another and rebellion. There's a difference. There are several words for sin in the scripture. But sin is sin when it is against God and it breaks his precepts. That is, we're not talking character defects. Sin is not a character defect. Now, we have some character defects. We have frailty. He knows our frame. He remembers we're dust. We're in the flesh. But the heart and the attitude, there can be, according to Jesus, a perfect love, but not perfect performance always, okay? But, I have given this example. Then people kind of start to get it, maybe. I have said, do you love your wife? So I'll try this with Mark. It's kind of scary, but no, Mark. I say to Mark, do you love your wife? Yes. Do you cheat on her every day? No. Well, how in the world can you not cheat on her every day? Why? Because I love her. Because you love her. Because you have a relationship. We have a bond. You have a bond. You can cheat on God every day, but you can't cheat on your wife or husband. Now, if I asked him, are you always perfectly performing? I, I won't ask her. Are you always perfectly <laughs> performing? Absolutely not. <laughs> if I were to go through the scriptures, and the word perfect is teleos, meaning complete, and I've told you that a little child can have, be a complete picture of health, but they're not going to be called that ten years from now if they're still doing the same things. But God knows exactly where you're at. And the word perfect is used constantly in Scripture with regards to a perfect heart or perfect love. You can just look it up yourself. And it means complete. I can... Do you think that God meant something less than thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Right? So we're talking about love here today. What if you knew what you were without him, knew what he's offered you, eternal life, you just got saved from death if you confess. But David, it says, I'm confessing. 
I need a new heart in me. Don't banish me. Don't take, restore the joy of your salvation. And then he goes on, I will teach others your way. He ended up saying this too. The sacrifice pleasing to God is not a burnt offering. It's not, I'm sorry, there's my offering. He said, it's a broken spirit and a humble heart. If all the church message, and it's not, this is not about living in sin, it's being set free. And if you sin, you have an advocate who can take you right back up. If we sin, we have an advocate with what? Not when and every day. If you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. And don't go off and say, man, he's teaching some kind of, you know, self-righteousness or perfection. I could go through a hundred scriptures in the New Testament alone. And all you'd have to do is Google about sinlessness and a perfect heart and righteousness before God. But it's about love and having my love complete for Him. And my life will grow into that love. Maybe you can understand it better this way. No one can guarantee you'll be sinless. But I can guarantee you, if the love of Christ is driving you and your eyes are fixed on Him, you may not be sinless, but you'll sin less. That's important. If not, the blood of Jesus Christ is a waste. If not, you have nothing to bless Him for. If you, if you have to walk the same way the world, you have no message for the world. Why, why do we tell people to come to Christ? Oh, by the way, you'll be just like me, but you'll be forgiven. You mean there's no change? There's no transformation? That isn't what David said. Set my spirit right. Change my heart, God. Break it. Make me humble. That's why he can just jump up and down and say, you know what? So he went through all that and God forgave him. And you know what he ends up saying? Don't forget his benefits. He pardons and cleanses your sin. And then next week he heals all of your diseases. We'll get into that. But I have a, I have a way I, I want to close. First of all, I'll tell you this, that his, um, the seriousness of sin. Who's seen the commercial? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? What happens here stays here. Well, I want to tell you what happens at the cross is spread everywhere. In fact, did you know that he says, when a sinner truly repents, a lost sheep. In Luke 15, he brings up the lost sheep. He said there's more rejoicing in heaven over one that's lost that is found and the shepherd brings back home than all the 90 had died. All of heaven rejoices when somebody repents and comes to Christ in faith. All of heaven rejoices. And on earth. In fact, Jesus is the shepherd in that picture. He says he puts it on his shoulders, the lamb, and he comes and he carries it back. And he says, let's have a party. Someone, my lost sheep is found. So I just, I want to share this this morning with you. I've got permission, I think. Right, Brad? <laughs> I had a call from Brad yesterday. It's just, it's terrific. What God is doing. He called me and I'm going to share what he said. Um, first of all, Brad made a commitment to Christ in a hospital and he was in pretty bad shape, but that isn't why he made the commitment. He was just ready to make a commitment to Christ again. And something's just been going on in his life, in his life, that is so new and so different in everything. 
He's got a real zest for living now. Who knows what he wants to do next? He's scary. He's getting all excited. <laughs> but Brad gave his life to Christ. But yesterday he called, and he said, I got a call I need to tell you about. He said, and Brad's had a lot of illnesses. Carries a lot of illnesses. Been treated for a lot of illnesses. He's a walking miracle. All of you are if you know Christ because you all have a past. But Brad is, is a miracle. But let me tell you what happened. He got a call. He says, doctor called me. Now this is probably not the best way for a doctor to start a conversation. The doctor said to Brad, are you sitting down? And Brad told me, he said, as soon as I heard that, I thought, Am I going to die? <laughs> uh, and he said, yes, I'm sitting. And the doctor then said, Brad, there is no sign at all of hepatitis C in your body. It's gone. Okay. Now let me tell you something about Brad was so excited. And he shouldn't be. Because here's the story that he wanted me to tell. But he said, Sam, I just don't know. Uh, if I can do the words and I might stumble, but he said, will these people like me less if I share it or what? I don't know what should be said. And we talked about that. I said, anybody that likes you less for sharing what I'm going to share, it's their problem, it's not yours. That's right. yeah. But here's what happened to Brad. He said, I want it shared because somebody might have a grandchild or somebody in your place might be struggling with drugs. And he said, at 18 years old, a gal wanted me to coke, cocaine, I think you said, to inject cocaine. And he did because he wanted to be in with her, he thought, maybe I'll have a girlfriend or something like that. But the point is not that. He said, so out of that needle, I got hepatitis. And I have carried that, and it's affected every illness because of his immune system. It affects everything. We've told you before that Brad lived on the streets, and wherever he could find shelter in buildings, he had a praying dad and a praying mom, praying family. But Brad is a walking miracle of the transformation power of Jesus Christ. And he said, go ahead and tell him. Don't do it. Don't go the way that I did. And he said it got worse and it went to alcohol and alcohol and alcohol. But he's free from that today, right, Brad? He's free. Yes, you can applaud. It says in Hebrews, there is a great cloud of witnesses. Great cloud of witnesses that have gone on before, cheering on.